I'd like to introduce Professor Chris Christensen of Northern Kentucky University. He's going to be talking to us tonight about the JN25, the, uh, a Japanese encryption system. Professor Christensen, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Jerry. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about JN25. It's a cipher I've been exploring for about 10 years. JN25 was the primary Japanese naval cipher during World War II. It was introduced on the 1st of June, 1939. This is an early intercept. Now, code breaking is done by finding patterns, and we'll return to this intercept a little bit later and look at some of the patterns. The message consists of the 15 five-digit groups that you see at the bottom. Initially, this is called the five numeral cipher. The name JN25 was assigned to it in March of 1942. The information above the five digit groups is the heading, and that tells who the sender is, who's receiving the message, to whom the message is copied, the sorts of things that are used in traffic analysis. But before considering the cipher, let's first consider how the Japanese language can be transmitted by a telegraph or a radio telegraph. Perhaps the most familiar alphabet for Japanese is kanji, Chinese characters. This is a precise way to communicate. Hiragana and katakana are ways to express kanji and foreign words phonetically. Each of these alphabets can express the same sounds. The problem with hiragana and katakana is that it's common that several kanji characters sound the same, and therefore they're expressed the same way in hiragana or katakana. It's necessary then for the receiver to determine which kanji character is meant by, meant by context. And that can be difficult. Romaji is also phonetic. Romaji represents the sounds of hiragana and katakana in terms of Roman letters. The Imperial Japanese Navy used two alphabets for ciphers, katakana and romaji. Messages were sent by telegraph or radio telegraph. Naval attaches like the diplomats used romaji because they often had to send message by commercial telegraph which required the use of Roman letters. But the Navy also used katakana. Now, Romaji, of course, was transmitted using international Morse code. The Japanese had a special kana character Morse code for sending katakana. Now, in some cases, international Morse code and kana Morse code overlap. If we look in the right-hand column, Notice the uh, kana letter ra. It's expressed in terms of romaji here. In kana moris, ra is expressed as dot dot dot. In international moris, that's the letter s. Immediately beneath it is the kana character re. Re is transmitted as dash dash dash. That's the international moris for the letter o. Now, US Navy intercept operators were taught Kana Morris. They had to learn to record it by stick, that is by pencil. But they're also taught to use a specially designed typewriter, the Underwood code machine, which is usually referred to as the RIP-5. If, for example, the intercept operator heard dot, 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 Morris S, you type the letter S in the standard position on the keyboard, but what the typewriter would type would be the kana letter Ra. Similarly, if the intercept operator heard dash dash dash, Morse letter for O, he would type the letter O, but what the typewriter would type would be the kana letter Re. The operator would just have to learn the keyboard positions for those kana characters that didn't know did not overlap with international Morris. Now there were some ancestors for JN25. 
Jan 25's history goes back to the Jap Imperial Japanese Secret Operations Code of 1918. 1921, 1922, the Office of Naval Intelligence and the FBI made surreptitious entry into the Japanese consulate in New York City. And they photographed the entire code book. Office of Naval Intelligence then came to an agreement with Naval Communications to exploit the code. The need to exploit that 1918 code was a significant factor that led to Naval Communications establishing a research desk on the 5th of January, 1924. And Lieutenant Lawrence Safford was named to that desk. Safford hired Agnes Driscoll to be a code breaker. Now she had joined the Navy in 1918 as a chief yeoman and was eventually assigned to the Navy's code and signal section. After World War I, she stayed on with the Navy as a civilian until 1923, when she left to work at the Hebron Cipher Machine Factory. Safford hired her back in 1924. Driscoll's a legend in US Navy code breaking. She was called Miss Aggie or Madam X, and she led many Navy code breaking efforts and instructed many early Navy code breakers. The Navy called the 1918 code the Red Book Code. The name came because the photocopies of the code were stored in a red Buckram McKee binder. The code book was translated by Dr. B.C. Hayworth and his wife. The Hayworths had served as missionaries in Japan. On this side, we, slide, we see a um, Japanese word in Romaji on the right in its translation. On the left, there are three possible substitutions that come from the code book. You could substitute a five digit number. You could substitute a five letter string or you could substitute a three kana string. In the messages that the Navy intercepted, all the substitutions were done by the three kana strings. So Driscoll and her team knew the substitutions, but the code was also enciphered by transposition. That is, once the substitutions were made, the order of the kana characters was rearranged. Therefore, the job of the research desk was to break the transposition cipher that was applied to the kana characters. This was accomplished by 1926. The transposition cipher actually changed several times, but the code book remained in place until the 1st of December 1930. At that time, it was replaced by what was called the Blue Book Code. Blue Book, of course, because the code was named, it kept in a blue binder. The story is told that in late September 1931, Miss Aggie was looking over the shoulder of Thomas Driss Dyer, one of her most advanced code breaking students, who was assembling information associated with the Red Book Code. But he had hit a bottom problem. She took his papers and after a few minutes announced that the problem was that Dyer was not was looking not at the Red Book Code, but at a new four kind of code. So a new attack began. In this case, Driscoll and her team needed to recover not just the code, not, not just the cipher, but also the code book. In the blue book code, after the, the substitutions from the code book took place, the string of kind of characters were separated by dots into 10 character lines. And then the transposition cipher was applied to the 10 by 10 arrays. The Blue Book Code stayed in use until 1938 when it was replaced by an enciphered code called AD. Now, some documents refer to the replacement for the Blue Book Code as the Black Book Code. Cryptologic historian Robert Hanyuk states that there never was a Black Book Code. Now, AD was similar to the Blue Book Code, it, but it didn't remain in use in law. On the 1st of June, 1939, AD was replaced 
by the enciphered code that would become known as JAN25. AD did remain in use, however, and in November 1940, changes were made to the code and its use was restricted, and that cipher became known as the flag officer cipher. Now, three things were necessary to send and receive messages in JN25. One was the code book that consisted of all the words and phrases that could be used in communications and the five digit numbers that could be substituted for them. JAN 25 had about 55,000 codebook entries. JAN 25 was enciphered by additives. Therefore, it was also necessary to have a book of additives, tables of five digit numbers that were used to mask the clear code book groups. Most commonly, the additive books had either 300 pages or around 500 pages, typically with around 100 additives in a 10 by 10 array on each page. It was also necessary to have instructions that describe the methods of use of this cipher. So first of all, let's encipher a message. Uh, this is an extremely brief message. The sender wants to report 10 US Navy battleships in the style of a Japanese naval message, US Navy, battleships, 10. So from the code book, the sender determines the five, five digit numbers that are substituted for the phrases in the message. Then the sender turns to the additive book and selects a page in the additives that we can use to mask the clear code groups. In this case, the sender has selected the first additive to be 04486. That's in line two, column zero on page 137. Places this additive under the first clear code group, successive additives under the successive clear code groups. Now the clear code groups and the additives are combined using false addition. And false addition just means to add without any carries. So in particular, a five digit group would not expand to a six digit group. So let's begin on the left. Two plus zero is two, four plus four is eight, three plus four is seven, nine plus eight is 17. We don't use the carry, we just keep the seven. Six plus six is 12. Don't use the carry, just keep the two. In the middle, three plus nine, six is nine, one plus five is six, one plus three is four, four plus six is 10, don't keep the carry, just the zero. Three plus eight is 11, again, don't keep the carry, just keep the one. On the right, seven plus seven is four, four plus zero is four, Four plus two is six, one plus seven is eight, two plus zero is two. And then what gets transmitted are the numbers that are in orange. Now, because the sender selects the additive string, it's necessary for him to include information in the message to tell the receiver how to locate the string of additives in the additive book information about the starting point and often the ending point was included in the message. Usually the starting point and ending point were described by a five digit number, consisted of a three digit page number, a one digit line number, and a one digit column number. So in this case, the starting point were on page 137, line two, column zero, and the ending point on page 137, line two, column two. Now these weren't sent in the clear. The starting point and the ending point were enciphered by additives from a small table, usually about a thousand additives. It was included with the method, method, methods of use with the instructions. So this is what's got transmitted, let's decipher it. So the sender would first, or the receiver would first have to determine the location of the additive string 
and then place the additives underneath the enciphered code groups. Now the receiver would have to determine the clear code groups by subtracting. Now we added without carrying, so now we're going to need to subtract the borrow as necessary. So again, beginning on the left, zero from two is two, four from eight is four, four from seven is three, eight from seven. So I'm gonna to have to think of this as eight from 17, so I get a nine. Six from two, I'm gonna to have to think of as six from 12, so I'm gonna get a six. In the middle, six from nine is three, five from six is one, three from four is one. Six from zero, I'm gonna to have to think of that as six from 10, I get a four. Eight from one, I'm thinking of eight from 11, and I get a three. On the right, seven from four is seven, zero from four is four, two from six is four, seven from eight is one, and zero from two is two. So we've reco recovered the clear code groups. And then the receiver would look those up in the code book and substitute for them the words and phrases from the code book. Now, because radio transmission was often garbled, it was not unusual to have error detection schemes built into the clear code groups. Such was the case with JN25. It turns out that each of the clear code groups is a five digit number that's divisible by three. Now that's mathematically equivalent to requiring that the sum of the digits of the clear code groups be a multiple of three. British and American code breakers referred to this property as scanning. Now, error detection schemes require the creation of a pattern that when it's not present, tells the receiver that an error has occurred. So code breakers, of course, they search for patterns to make sense of what appears to be randomness. British and American code breakers were able to, we'll see later, exploit the patterns created by scanning in their attacks on JN25. JN25 evolved throughout the war. The code books changed, the additives books changed, and the methods of use changed. The various versions are designated this way. Uh, JN, of course, stands for Japanese Naval. 25 is the number that's assigned to the enciphered code. The code books were designated by letters of the alphabet. This is code book B. The additive books were designated by numbers. This is additive book eight. The code books went from A to R with the exception of O and Q. And the cipher books went from one to 77, the additive books. Now, code breaking is typically a three-step process. First, it's necessary to determine the location of the additive strings. This is typically done by breaking that indicator system and be able to recover the small table of key additives. Secondly, the text additives and the clear code groups are recovered. And finally, the meetings of the clear code groups have to be determined. So let's look at the first breaks. The first break into JN25 was made by the British code breaker, John Tildman. His success against JN25 was based upon his having previously solved a Japanese army cipher that had a similar structure. He solved the uh, Japanese army cipher when the government code and cipher school had briefly moved to Bletchley Park during the Munich crisis in 1938. So let's go back to the message we saw at the beginning of the slides and notice some of the patterns. But one thing that stands out is that the five digit number 38785 is repeated. It occurs as a second group and the second to the last group. 
So this should signal that whatever information that conveys is important to the receiver. Also this five digit number at the end, 01085, might not be immediately obvious, but after a few intercepts, you would notice that this is a date time indicator. 01 is the day of the month. This was transmitted on the 1st of June. And 085 is the time to the nearest 10 minutes, 0850, 8.50 AM. So this must also be inf important information for the receiver. In his oral histories, Tiltman describes his contribution to the breaking of JN25 as being the recovery of the locations of the additive strings, the first step of the code breaking process. Here's what they found out about those additive strings, their locations. So the first three digits were the three digit page number of the additive book on which the string began. In this case, in this case page 410. In that first additive book, only the lines, not the columns were numbered. And the additives always began in the leftmost column. So the fourth digit was the line number. So in this case, we're starting in the leftmost column of line number one. The fifth digit, the meaning was never determined. And then that five digit number that describes the location of the beginning of the additive string, that was enciphered using an additive from this list of key additives. And there was a different additive every day. And that's why the day was so important in the message. So in this case, the um, starting point is 38785. And that was the repeated group in the message. So the indicator for the starting point of the additive string was repeated in the message. Now remember the JN25 came into use on the 1st of June, 1939, but by the 7th of September, 1939, the government code and cipher school was able to describe its structure. They described it to the Far East Combined Bureau in Singapore. First, they noted that there were 30,000 five-digit groups arranged on 300 pages. There were 10 starting points on each page. Those corresponded to the line numbers. And they were numbered 0, 1, 2, up to 9 in order. The pages of the additive book were numbered 002, 005, 008, 011, all the way up to 899. So the page numbers jumped by three, and they were always one less than a multiple of three. The starting point indicator, as we saw, consisted of a three-digit page number followed by a one-digit line number. They had not determined and never would determine a meeting for the fifth digit. The starting point was enciphered by additives that change daily. So within three months, they knew the structure of JN25, but of course what was left to, to exploit this knowledge by recovering those key additives, which mask the starting point, the text additives, recover clear code groups and determine their meanings. U.S. Navy code breaking team that attacked JN25 was headed by Agnes Driscoll. Prescott Courier was a member of that team. Again, recall that the designation JN25 was not applied to the cipher until March of 1942. Prior to that, it was referred to as a five numeral system. Orange was the color code that the U.S. Navy used for Japan. Uh, in U.S. Navy war plans, the various navies in the world were designated by colors rather than by their countries. A war diary note dated in March of 1940, and this is at the bottom, mentions that the first U.S. Navy break into JN25 was made by Mrs. Driscoll. 
so somewhere around March 1940. But it's not clear what, we, what she had determined at this point. A note dated September 1940, about a year after Tiltman's success, mentions that Driscoll and her team had recovered information that was comparable to Tiltman's recovery. And by this time, the Navy was referring to the code as AN. Now, a difference in their recoveries seems to reflect that the work done by the Americans and the British was independent. So remember that the British code breakers believed that the pages of the additive book were numbered 002, 005, 008, up to 899. Jumping in threes, always one less than a multiple of three. US code breakers believed that the pages were numbered 001, 002, 003, up to 300, and that the page numbers were enciphered by multiplying page numbers by three and subtracting one. We end up with the same numbers, of course. So after having recovered the structure of JN25, the US code breakers also had to exploit that. They needed to determine the key additives, recover key additives, recover text additives, recover clear code groups, determine their meanings and so forth. They had thought they'd be able to do that by the spring of 1941. But in December 1940, the Japanese changed the code book. Now the additive book didn't change, but the code book did change. And it was necessary to recover new clear code groups and their meanings. It was a little bit harder because although the first code book had been a one part code within categories, the second code was a two part code. There are three primary US Navy code breaking stations. Station Negat in Washington, DC. This was located in the main Navy building on Constitution Avenue. Their function was primarily to do research. Their station Hypo in Honolulu. They were assigned to attack the flag officer cipher, which was never broken. I mean, there were just too few intercepts to find patterns in the messages and stationed cast in the Philippines, they were, because of their location near Japan, they were assigned to attack JN-25. Now, at the same time, the British Far East Combined Bureau was located in Singapore. Initially, they'd been located in Hong Kong, but because of the war in China, they had moved to Singapore. Then, after the war in the Pacific began, in uh, spring of 1942, they moved briefly to Colombo, which is now in Sri Lanka, but then quickly moved again to Kilindini in Mobasa on the east coast of Africa. And in 1943, moved back to Colombo. In February 1941, a US team consisting of Abraham Sinkoff and Leo Rosen of the Army's Signal Intelligence Service, and Prescott Courier and Robert Weeks of the US Navy's Op-20G visited Bletchley Park. It was during this visit the US presented a purple analog to the British code breakers. On the 10th of February, 1941, while the US team was still in Bletchley Park, the Far East Combined Bureau was ordered to begin a full exchange of materials and methods with the US code breakers in the Philippines. In late February, Malcolm Burnett from the Far East Combined Bureau visited Station Cast in the Philippines. And on the 5th of March, a report from Station Cast notes what was received from the Far East Combined Bureau, and also that they had set up a secure method of communicating between the two stations. So let's look at an intercept. So here's a JN25 intercept from January 1943. 
Now, again, there's a heading above the message. That's information that was used for traffic analysis. The message begins with the six-digit group. And that six-digit group is followed by 26 five-digit groups. So let's look at some of the patterns that the code breakers had noticed and what they meant. We noticed that six-digit group at the beginning of the message, that's easy to spot. But also notice that the last five digits of that group are repeated as the second to the last group. So again, must be important information. This turns out to be the date time indicator again. It's the 15th day of January. So the one five in the six digit group is the day of the month. 1630 is the time, 4.30 PM. So it must be important that the receiver know this information. This five digit group, 54902, that appears twice as the second group and as the last group. Now it turns out that the first three digits of this, 549, selected the additives that were used to mask the starting point and ending point indicators. And the group itself was determined by the date and time. So that Date and time groups were important to determine this group, which is important to determine the additives for the starting point and ending point. These are the starting point and ending point indicators. 05099 and 56397, that's the starting point of the additive strings. The position is, is uh, repeated obviously enciphered by different additives. At the end, 35238, that's the ending point of the additive string. The starting point and ending point are indicated as a five digit number. Of course, these are enciphered, but a five digit number consisting of a three digit page number, a one digit line number, and a one digit column number. Now, at this point time, there were 100 additives in a 10 by 10 array on each page of a 300 page additive book. And both the lines and columns were numbered by single digits in order. And the sender selected the page and chose the starting point. So this was the important information we see in the message for the code breaker. So assuming that the indicator system had been broken and it was possible to determine the starting points and ending points of the additive strings, then messages could be placed in depth. So let's discuss depth for a moment. What I'm showing here, I'm just looking at positions on pages of additives. So I, I don't have the actual additives here. On the left, I'm thinking of a message that was enciphered with an additive string that began on page 304 on line four, column three, and ended on page 304, line six, column five. On the right, another message. The additive string for this message began on page 304, line five, column two, and ended on page 304, line seven, column one. Now there's an overlap in the use of the additives. Where they overlap, depth is created. What that means is the corresponding code groups in each message were enciphered by the same additives. So let's do a bit of code breaking. Here are portions of six intercepts that are in depth. We see four columns. The intercepted messages, their transmitted code groups are between the horizontal lines. 
So in column one, the first message, the group that was transmitted is 06009. Codebreakers have actually already determined the additives for column one, three, and four. And they strip the additives from the enciphered code groups and right below the transmitted code groups are the clear code groups. So again, for that message in column one, the one on top, the transmitted code group was 06009. With the additive removed, the clear code group is 28434. And then where known, the meanings, of, the meanings of the clear code groups have been inserted. And 28434 corresponds to the Kana character Ni. Now the meanings have been determined for everything in column one, three, and four, except the very last one in column three. We know the clear code group, but not its meaning. But we know nothing about the groups in column two. We have only the enciphered code groups. So let's attack column two. After we've recovered enough clear code groups, it's possible to use a method called a difference table to recover the text additives in more clear code groups. It's based on depth. So remember when enciphered groups are in depth, that means they've been enciphered by the same additive. And if one of these groups is subtracted from the other, the additives is stripped off. And what we're left with is the difference of the clear code groups. So here's an example. Uh, the two Groups on the left in orange are enciphered code groups, 06009, these, these are groups that would have been transmitted. They're both, they've both been enciphered by the same additive. When one is enciphered from the other, we get the same difference on both sides. If I subtract the transmitted code groups, the orange ones, or subtract the clear code groups, the white ones, they get the same difference because the additives are zeroed out. Before a difference table can be constructed, we have to have enough clear code groups, probably about a hundred high frequency code groups. And then what we do is we take the clear code groups one at a time and subtract them from each of the 99 others and record those differences in the table. So I've got 100, say, high frequency code groups, things that occur very commonly in messages. One at a time, I subtract them from the 99 others and record all of those differences. That's the difference table. So I'm going to use this difference table to try to recover the additive and the clear code groups from column number two. So remember these guys are in depth. If I subtract one of these groups from the others, I've stripped off the additive. So I'm going to start by subtracting group one from all of the others. What I now have is a column of differences of clear code groups. And we'll go look at the difference table and see whether any of these differences appear. Did I luck out? Did I manage to hit a column in which I had two high frequency code groups whose differences are going to appear in a table? In this case, that's not true. So go back to the groups in depth again. This time I'm going to subtract the second group from all of the others and look at the differences. In this case, we do luck out. The difference 15103, that appears in the difference table. 
So I've got that difference appearing two ways now. Once from the enciphered code groups and once from the difference table. In the difference table, it happens to be the difference of these two very frequently used groups, 94275, which is an instructor instruction to the uh, deciphering clerk to switch to using an alternate table for the following two code groups. And 89172, which is the Roman letter E. The difference of those two frequently used groups is 15103. So again, it's occurred twice. Once in my column of groups that are in depth and once in the difference table. What I wanna know is, can I find an additive that I can put on these groups on the right, same additive in both, that will give the groups on the left? Well, a bit of subtraction says yes. 95689 works as an additive for both of these. That's a potential additive for column number two for this group of transmitted co-groups. So let's subtract it and see what we get. I subtracted 95689 from all the groups in that column, and I get these guys. And these are potentially clear code groups. But how can we tell? This is where we can exploit the garble table or the error detection that was built into JM25. Remember, all of the clear code groups have to be numbers that are divisible by three. So I can check. Are each of these numbers divisible by three? Do they scan? Well, one not. Still, it's very unusual to, to take, say, five random five-digit numbers in, or, and get them to scan. So what's more likely here is that the additive is correct, but this fifth group is a result of a garble. Now that conclusion is confirmed by the fact that I happen to know the meanings of those other clear code groups, and they all fit in the context of the messages. So by using this difference table, I've been able to determine the additive for column number two. I've been able to determine that the fifth group is a garble and the meaning of all the other clear code groups. And that's typical. That's, that was the way that most JN25 messages were broken. Now, on the 16th of November, 1941, so this is just before the attacks on Pearl Harbor and Southeast Asia, a Lieutenant Lightweiler, who was at Station Cast in the Philippines, wrote to Lieutenant Park, who was at Station Negat in Washington, D.C., and he describes the use of the, different, of the difference table and says that it is a new system of attack. There's a handwritten note in the left margin, probably by Park, that says, same as our new technique. A report by Station Negat describes this development as a simultaneous independent thought. Now their report describes how the code breakers at Station Negat developed the method of a difference table. Of course, the reports from Station Cast tell a different story. A yeoman at Station Cast named Anderson is credit, credited with the idea of a difference table. Yet another possibility is that the code breakers at Station Cast might have learned the method from the code breakers at the Far East Combined Bureau because Sinkoff's report on the February 1941 visit to Bletchley Park mentions that Bletchley Park was constructing difference tables at that time. Now, 
This is a manual machine that was used to carry out the same work that we just did by hand. The Navy constructed actually a series of such machines, one of which was electromechanical. This is called the depth analyzer. It's got 12 rows for five digit numbers. The numbers are entered by in the rows by turning the knobs on the top of the number dials. Knobs on the bottom of the machine are used to add or subtract from each column. So all the differencing that we just did could be done by this machine. Now notice that the digits are colored here, yellow, red, or green. The coloring is used to determine scanning. So remember, these are the potential clear code groups we recovered by hand. If we had done the work on the depth analyzer, they would have looked like this. And the feeling was that rather than have the code breakers use arithmetic to check for divisibility by three, they could just check by looking at color patterns. So after the attacks by the Japanese on the 7th of December, 1941, it was necessary to quickly shift from sort of a gradual cryptanalytic recovery to recovery that was quick enough to provide operational intelligence. However, on the 4th of December, 1941, just prior to the attacks, the JN25 additive book had changed, but the code book didn't change. So because the code book didn't change, the previous difference tables remained in use, and it was only necessary to recover new additives. Joe Roqueford's code breakers at Station Hypo in Honolulu were switched from attacking the flag officer's cipher to attacking JM25. In the Far East, Station Cast in the Philippines was actually located at Corregidor at the time, and the Far East Combined Bureau was located in Singapore, they both had to relocate, and hence their work was disrupted. The station cast personnel were relocated to Australia and merged with an Australian Signals Intelligence Unit and formed FRUMEL, Fleet Radio Unit in Melbourne, and continued the work there. By March of 1942, the Navy was developing operational intelligence from Jan 25. They had enough intelligence that the Navy was able to stop the Japanese attack on Port Moresby in the Battle of the Coral Sea. By the end of May, or at the end of May, the Japanese changed both the code book and the additive book for Jan 25. But by that time, the Navy had already obtained the Japanese or order of battle for the Battle of Midway. And Admiral, Admiral Dimbitz was able to ambush the four Japanese carriers that were spearheading that attack, and all were sunk. There was a war correspondent, Stanley Johnston. He was aboard the carrier Lexington when she was sunk during the Battle of Coral Sea. As he was returning to the United States with crew from Lexington, they became aware of the information that Admiral Nimitz had received from JN-25 intercepts prior to the Battle of Midway. Upon his return to the US, Johnston wrote a story about the battle that was published in the Chicago Tribune and in other papers. And the story, of course, suggested that the Navy had broken JN-25. The Navy, of course, was furious, and they expected the Japanese to replace or make changes in JN-25. In fact, in August of 1942, a major change did occur. 
the cipher was split into four channels using different code books and different additives. Now, some people have attributed this as a response to Johnston's story. However, it seems like more likely explanation is that the volume of Jan 25 traffic had just become too large. It was necessary to split it into channels. These channels remained in, in place throughout the war. Except for highlighting that initial break into Jan 25 by John Tiltman, and the early contributions by the Far East Combined Bureau, little is said about the British work on Jan 25. The primary reason is that on the 2nd of October 1942, the US Navy and Bletchley Park agreed to divide the responsibilities for code breaking. The agreement was called the Holden Agreement. British agreed to withdraw from cryptanalytic work in the Pacific area. This was just practical at the time. It permitted the British to focus on cryptanalytic work that was resulting from the war in Europe. It also said that the direction and control of cryptanalytic work against the Japanese was assigned to the US Navy. But Bletchley Park would re retain a small research and intelligence section so as to not lose touch with the Japanese problem. In September of 1943, after Italy withdrew from the war, the Italian section at Bletchley Park found themselves out of work. The Italian code breakers were familiar with additive ciphers and they, therefore they were reassigned to reinforce the JN25 team. After a couple months to become familiar with JN25, it began working out their relationship with the US Navy's Op20G. A major assignment that they received was to attack JN25 L53. This is a cipher that was an emergency use cipher for one month during the summer of 1944. What made this cipher particularly inter interesting and also particularly difficult was that those text additives, they didn't come from a separate table, or the key additives, they didn't come from a separate table, they actually used the text additives to encipher the starting points and ending points. So the Bletchley Park code breakers needed to recover the text additives to determine the starting points and ending points, but they also needed to know the starting points and ending points to recover the text additives. JN25 evolved throughout the war. And I want to mention just two times when the attacks seemed to be in jeopardy. Now recall that current decryption of JN25 had begun just prior to the battles of Coral Sea and Midway. As code books or additive books changed, US Navy code breakers were mostly able to break back in quickly. But on the 15th of April, 1943, a new method of use appeared. The repetition of the starting point that we saw in the message we broke and a new method of ciphering the starting point and ending point appeared and code breakers were blacked out for more than a month. On the 25th of July, 1944, JN25N62 was introduced. This was the most secure of the JN25 ciphers. Several changes had occurred simultaneously. There's a new garble check there was a new error detection scheme. Instead of scanning, instead of the five digit code groups being divisible by three, the five digit code groups, clear code groups now did not contain any zeros. There was a new code book, code book N or NAN. And instead of having a 10 by 10 array 
of additives on a page, there was a 20 by 10 array of additives on a page. And the lines were paired. So they were used in such a way that given a pair of lines, if the message was being sent during an odd number of hours during the day, the message began on the top row of the additives. If it were sent during an even number of days, it began on the bottom row of the additives of the pair. And furthermore, they had grills that could be placed over the page and would block out some of the additives. They also changed the order in which the lines were used. Allied code breakers were blacked out for four months. The new cipher was complex to break and it was never broken currently. But it was also complex to use. And it turned out that the Japanese cipher clerks didn't like using it. And they began sending messages in less secure ciphers. So in a sense, the Japanese were forced to make Japanese uh, JN25 easier to use so that their cipher clerks would use it. But in doing so, they also made it easier to break. Now, throughout the war, the intelligence from code barracking was combined with intelligence gathered from traffic analysis. The information of who the messages were coming from, who they were being sent to, who was being copied on them, how many were being sent, and so forth. During those times when the code breaking was blacked out, traffic analysis had to share, shoulder the entire burden of the intelligence. So that's a quick look at JN25. Thanks for the opportunity to present this um, for your interest. And I'm willing to try to answer questions. And I'm pleased to see that your last slide says, Arangato uh, <laughs> gozaimashita. Well, that's good. So are there any questions for uh, Professor Christensen? Yeah. Seems as though you're going to get off easily. Ah, uh, well, am I seeing something in chat here? Yes, can you give more details about the color device? I guess that means the additive machine. So this is something recent. Uh, it's actually on display at the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC right now. So apparently, um, National Cryptologic Museum has just taken it out of the warehouse. They're closed and it is on display at the International Spy Museum. There, there seem to be a series of four such machines. Uh, one of them was made by a national cash register company and went into use in 1943. Um, that was an electromechanical device. It was used at Bletchley Park, and I think it also got to the Far East. Um, the earlier devices, it's not quite clear how many of them there were and what they looked like. Um, they're they're revert, sometimes referred to as a Jeep or a Jeep 4. Jeep because of GYP, which was the cryptanalytic unit for the Pacific. Um, the one that is shown there, the people at the International Spy Museum believe that it was used at Honolulu Station Hypo during the um, code breaking for the, which they gathered the information about the attack on Midway. Um, there's various comments about such machines that for the most part, the code breakers are actually able to work as quickly by hand as they were by machine. So I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, another question from Alan, who's asking, Simpson's account of the Japanese fleet general purpose system was made available at the National Archives in 2013. Does this address the work on JN25? Yes, um, actually that's, that's one of the things I've been working on recently is uh, Bletchley Park's contribution to JN25. Um, 
I, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work at a distance with Edward Simpson. Uh, when I first began working on JN25, and in particular, I began working on one of those machines, one of those additive machines. Uh, and it was one he had experience with, and I was put in contact with him. And over a number of years, uh, we communicated and worked on, did some joint work on Jan 25. He, he taught me a lot about the uh, British work on Jan 25. Um, yes, his, his paper does describe, there, there's sort of two documents in, in the National Archives that are now available. One is by one of the women who um, dealt with the uh, women code breakers and that, that team, it discusses the organization and the sort of the work processing of the JN25 unit. And then Simpsons, which picks up in 1943, he was part of the Italian um, section at JN25, or at Fletchley Park, It moved to JN25 and became the director of the JN25 section. Uh, and so he describes how JN25 was attacked at Bletchley Park. He also wrote another document uh, that describes in detail the mathematics used, but that's still classified. Okay, there's a follow-up question on the uh, additive machine, which is uh, what, <laughs> what was their actual name and how would you distinguish them? I'm not sure of the actual name. Um, the machine that was, went in use in 1943 and was electromechanical has always been described as the National Cash Register Additive Machine. Hmm. By the British code breakers, it was called fruit. And that referred to the fact that the window of the machine looked like um, a slot machine. Uh -huh. uh, so that's the way Simpson refers to it in his article in Code Breakers. The two earlier machines, one was called the Park Machine. And I was trying to remember the name of the other one. I've forgotten the other name that was attached to the machine. But there's a, there's a British document which indicates that there were four such machines. Um, I believe the one we're looking at is called an M4, but I'm not positive. It's hard to straighten out which machine is which from the from the Navy documents. Okay, I can answer Robert Harris's, an interesting name incidentally, but uh, I can answer Robert <laughs> Harris's question. Uh, it will be on YouTube. And I don't know when exactly it will appear. There's, we tend to put up roughly one a week and we, there's a bit of a backlog at the moment, but it will appear in maybe a month or so. You're welcome. There's a, not, there's a question about further development after the war. I see it. Um, if that refers to Jan 25, it, it, it stopped at the end of the war. And the rest all seem to be uh, thank yous of, uh, <laughs> so I guess that is the, you're welcome. Everybody's welcome. <laughs> I guess that does bring us to the end of this lecture. Oh, can you say anything about the unclassified mathematics? I'm not sure we understand that question, do we, or do we? The sort of the routine mathematics that was used, you, you saw in the presentation. Um, there's, there is an interesting, some interesting mathematics that occurred in 1943, 1944. And that involved work done both in the United States and at Bletchley Park. And Simpson describes it well in his, uh, his book on, his article in the book Code Breakers. And we also wrote a joint paper about it. And it's called um, Hall's, Hall's Weights. It has to do with uh, American mathematician Marshall Hall, who was a code breaker for the US Navy. And what Hall had wondered, apparently, 
during 1943, there was no problem placing messages in depth, aligning the messages so that they were in depth. They understood well the Japanese system for describing the starting points and ending points of the additive strings, that there was a three-digit page number, one-digit line number, one-digit column number, and that lines and columns were in order. But in December 1943, the Japanese changed that. And instead of having single-digit line numbers and single-digit column numbers, they switched to two-digit line numbers and two-digit column numbers, and they were in random order. So having broken the indicator system, there was still no way to put them in depth because if you had column number 12 and column number 53, you wouldn't know which one came first. They were in random order. Marshall Hall had been working on a system for placing messages in depth. And he felt that if you took two, if you subtracted two five-digit numbers that were divisible by three, as opposed to subtracting just two random five-digit numbers, you should be able to detect that. And he constructed a system of weights based on when you subtracted the five-digit numbers, whether they were in depth or not, whether you were subtracting numbers divisible by three or subtracting just random numbers. He went to Bletchley Park in January 1944, and he took that table of weights with him. The Bletchley Park Codebreakers, at that time headed by Simpson, adapted that table of weights using some Bayesian statistics to align messages in depth. And Simpson, Simpson tells that story well. Um, it's, there's interesting mathematics going on and interesting code breaking. So maybe that's at least one part of the class um, that's unclassified. That the classified or the document that is still classified by Simpson apparently discusses that in detail. And that's the document that's being withheld. So the US Navy has released all its, its information about the use of Hall's weights, but Bletchley Park is not. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> so I think that exhausts all the questions. So, and just to make a brief announcement of the, th of the next three talks that we'll be uh, presenting. August 11th, we'll have a, a talk about the uh, Obama's specific Japanese crypto machine, the Japanese green machine. Uh, this is a, uh, this is to follow on the theme of uh, Professor Christensen's talk, of course. Wednesday, August 18th, we have a talk about CERN. And on Sunday, August 22nd, we will have a talk about a Greek crypto machine, just for a change, called the DE59. A crypto machina DE59. And with that brief advert, I propose to close the call. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. I'd like to thank Professor Christensen for joining us. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>